Thank you for coming to the first annual Social Justice in Health Conference at SUNY Downstate. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the stolen land of the Canarsie peoples. We, would, we want to acknowledge the Canarsie community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We also acknowledge that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. This acknowledgement is a reminder to begin the process of working to dismantle ongoing le legacies of settler colonial co colonialism. Land was stolen through the very things that we as a hospital aim to prevent. Infectious disease, substance abuse, trauma, family separation. This land was also taken by direct violence against Canarsie people. We want to acknowledge that many alternative forms of justice are borrowed or in inspired by native peoples from all over the world. We want to acknowledge this because the, the theme of this year's Social Justice and Health Conference is community violence and transformative justice. We want to recognize that the school and the hospital aims to be diverse, but we are not reflective of the community. Medicine in the, in the United States, including downstate, is primarily white and Flatbush is primarily black and Afro-Caribbean. Our hospital can and has been a site of healing, but it has also been a site of violence and trauma. Medical apartheid is real. Medical racism is real. They exist here at our institutions, and if you're involved in healthcare in any way, they exist in, at your institutions as well. This acknowledgement is a reminder to begin the process of working to dismantle structural racism. We believe that communities inspire and drive the most radical transformations. We feel decentering academic voices and centering the voices who live and work in New York City communities is essential to driving change in our school, hospital, and community. So Nicole and I are third year students here at SUNY Downstate, um, and this is our ninth month of clinical rotations. Um, so I knew going in that medicine was sometimes uh, an institution of oppression, um, but I wanted access to medicine as a tool of justice. Um, but the truth is that it feels like the violence and the racism have been pretty pervasive to my experience. Um, and at its base, this kind, of, this kind of violence and racism looks like neglect. What does this neglect look like? It looks like not taking patients' complaints seriously. It looks like not visiting your patient for days while they're in the hospital. It looks like not informing pa patients about their conditions or about the management of their conditions not offering the correct care, not being curious about your patient's health or their lives, um, pushing a patient out of the hospital prematurely, not setting them pr up with proper aftercare. Um, and for some of my patients that I've had in the last nine months, this racist neglect looks like disres feels like disrespect to them and is disrespect to them. And for some of them, it causes them to avoid ac seeking access to the healthcare system. For some of them, it's caused serious mental health issues. For many that I have seen, it's led to the deterioration of their physical health. And for a few of my patients, it may have been part of what led to their deaths. Um, and this neglect means that many doctors and nurses don't trust their own families in the institutions in which they work. And that is a problem. Um, so how is racist neglect made possible? Um, it's possible when we underfund poor people's medicine, but more importantly, it's possible because we fail to dismantle segregated care systems. And like a segregated school system, that means that power, resources, and care are not evenly distributed. And it's because we fail to challenge our institutions of healing to be better. Neglect also means that we as healthcare professionals don't speak out about the messed up care that we see. Medicine's not a particularly self-reflective institution. That's where we start. I ask, is the care I'm providing good enough? Not perfect, but good. Is it safe? Is it respectful? Does it align with all of my patients' needs, including their cultural, spiritual, emotional, as well as their physical well-being? Is my patient being treated like a human being? Then you look at the institution and you ask, are there adequate systems in place to ensure that if these basic needs aren't met, change will be made to ensure that they are? Finally, we look at our healthcare system and we ask, do we have a system that shows that we value equitable care? Are the institutions where these needs are met concentrated in areas of wealth and privilege? Does the system make them available to my patients and to my community? And that is where we find ourselves today. 
We want to hold ourselves accountable. We want to hold our institution accountable. We want to hold our healthcare system accountable. This year, this conference was organized by medical students at SUNY Downstate, who are part of Downstate White Coats for Black Lives and other student organizations. We created this conference because we felt the need to critically analyze our role in the gentrification of Central Brooklyn and the structural inequalities that underlie the health disparities we observe on a daily basis. We also believe that our hospital system and school can be moved towards greater and radical community accountability. We believe that a social justice conference set at SUNY Downsey is essential because we are the only academic medical center in Brooklyn, and unlike other private medical schools, structural violence directly affects the physical, mental, and spiritual health of all of our patients. When we started planning this conference, we tried to break down what was most important to get out of this process. We do not think we have achieved all these goals, but this is only the beginning to thinking about transformative justice and community violence in the context of health and medicine. We hope that projects continue after today. We hope to create an action-oriented conference that puts the connections, theories, and ideas we have into use. As the day goes on, we would love if you kept the goals in mind and gave us feedback on where we are falling short and suggestions for how we could move towards greater accountability. The goals of our conference are one, to understand how violence and trauma manifest in Brooklyn communities, in particular for people who are black and brown, low income or poor, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus, femme, disabled, and or immigrants. Two, to dissect the structural and systemic inequalities that generate community-based violence. Three, to identify ways healthcare can be a site of violence and to prioritize healthcare as a site of spiritual, emotional, and physical healing. Four, to challenge mass incarceration and as a solution to violence and reimagine justice as community-based and transformative. This is our first conference and we want it to be an annual social justice and health conference so we value participation, thoughts, experiences, and feedback, and we, and we would love to learn how we can do better in coming years. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Rob Gore. He's an emergency medicine attending physician at Kings County Hospital and SUNY Downstate University Hospital. He is the founder and executive director of Kings Against Violence Initiative, or CAVI, a hospital, school, and a community-based youth violence intervention and empowerment program targeting teens and young adults here in Central Brooklyn who have been victims of violence or at risk of violent injury. Dr. Gore was also named a CNN hero in 2018. He is also my personal mentor. So please welcome to the stage, Dr. Rob Gore. Uh, good morning. Um, I wouldn't be myself if I didn't show up here in camouflage pants. It's kind of a signature thing, but part of it's just growing up in Brooklyn. I want to welcome everybody here this morning, uh, particularly the medical students. Um, taking a Saturday off um, in January of your first, second, or even third year medical school is almost a Herculean uh, <laughs> It's something out of this world because you don't have a lot of time. Time is not your own, but this is going to be the case for the rest of your career, at least until you go on vacation. But I want to welcome all of our visitors here. Um, one thing that I, I want to talk about, like the conversation today and the discussion is about rethinking trauma. Um, but I got to take you back a little bit. When you sit and write your essays to get in a professional school, uh, medical school, uh, master's, getting your master's of public health, we always talk about how do we engage in the community and talking about giving back to the community, but somehow those things get lost. They get lost in the regular day-to-day uh, -day responsibilities of being a student and all those things that were utopian in, in, in our thought and well-being wind up being pushed to the side because you gotta make a living. And if this, these processes aren't engaged on an ongoing basis, you tend to, uh, to forget this stuff. So creating a, a conference as medical students, as students of color, as marginalized members of the society, setting this stuff up as, a, as medical students is imperative in the well-being, not just for your own personal careers, but the vitality of the community in which we serve. Um, when we start thinking about trauma, there's so many things that come to mind. We think about blunt trauma, which could be anything from a motor vehicle rollover, uh, a car collision. And by the way, just as a disclosure, some of the images that you're going to see here are a little bit graphic, so if anyone has to step up, uh, or not step up, but uh, stand up, go outside, or even close your eyes, I completely understand. 
But trauma itself can be a physical process. We think about car, car crashes, uh, motor vehicle turnovers. We also think about penetrating trauma. This is a gentleman that we took care of at Kings County uh, who obviously has a stab wound to the back. Uh, you got a serrated knife there, so it's most likely some sort of a thing that was used in the kitchen. Uh, but trauma itself is more than just a physical process. It's a mental process, it's a psychological process. It can have long-standing uh, impact on the patients themselves, their communities, and their families. Um, one thing that we often talk about in the, uh, in the area of health, in, in particular public health, is social determinants of health. And as we talk about trauma being this physical process, there's so many different things that impact the well-being of the individual. Everything from their childhood experiences, where they live, how they live, their support systems, their economic situation, the community in which they come from, and like one of the uh, medical students mentioned a little bit earlier, having access to proper care. Now, I'm from Brooklyn. I was born in Buffalo, New York, but uh, we left right after I was born and uh, descended upon this great borough in 1979. Um, I also happened to go to um, elementary school directly across the street from Kings County Hospital, just down the street from uh, Downstate Medical Center on Lenox Road. And so coming back here, and my entire, the work that I do is, is really personal because I'm back home. Now, it started in Brooklyn, but it kind of evolved in other places. So after I left New York City, um, I came back to, uh, I went to Chicago to do my residency at Cook County Hospital. And Cook County Hospital is the hospital that ER is based off of. My family also happens to be from Chicago. So I wound up taking care of a lot of relatives and people that my family wound up knowing. But my story is a little bit different. Um, I was a resident working in our trauma emergency department. I believe this is before the work hour, before the work hour restrictions. So we had more than 80 plus hour weeks, easily 120 hour weeks uh, going on back then. But this day was a little bit different. It was August of 2005 and it was cold. Usually in the summertime, it's a little bit different in Chicago. People who've never been to the Midwest, it can go up to 100, 105, 110 degrees. That's the norm in Chicago. But this was August and it was 55 degrees cold and raining. Um, I was on a 24-hour trauma call, and one of my co-residents looked around and said, I'm bored, which is something no medical student or resident physician should ever say, and the nurses get pissed off at you if they say, I have nothing to do. And uh, he said, I'm bored, and I hope something exciting comes in. And group mentality kicked in, and the other residents around said, yeah, yeah, I hope something exciting comes in. I'm bored also. Um, because excitement meant penetrating trauma, excitement meant procedures, but excitement also meant that another young black or Latino male was coming in as a victim or survivor of violent trauma. And looking around the room, me and the clerk were the only two people of color in the entire trauma emergency department. Now again, my family's from Chicago. Some of them are engaged in some activity that might not be uh, considered scrupulous. And so I always wondered, if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, would that same level of excitement come? Uh, be, uh, we address them as having something exciting come in. I lived on the south side of Chicago also. Most of the patients that came in who were victims and survivors of trauma were my age, they looked like me. We might have had different accents, but I also wondered if I'm in the wrong place in the wrong time, is that same level of excitement gonna take place because you get a chance to do a procedure? And so I started thinking, and instead of just you know, wanting to hone my trauma resuscitation skills, I started looking and in investigating trauma as this public health issue, as this, as this factor, like if you wind up identifying all these different risk factors, and we wind up combating a lot of these risk factors, how do you overturn and how do you change the scope of violent trauma that's been plaguing uh, many communities around the world? So conflict itself is a normally occurring thing. And on a most basic level, it can mean an argument or a disagreement. But when power is misappropriated and there tends to be a shift, um, things tend to happen in, in a way that's not so favorable. That power is imbalanced. And imbalance in power can result in a lot of uh, disparities as it relates to income, uh, health itself. Um, it can also lead to uh, well, increased amounts of poverty can result as a res uh, due to that power imbalance that can result in anything from increasing gang activity to even war. Now, around the, around the world, according to the World Health Organization, 55% of the world lives in an urban area. In 30 years from now, 2050, that population is going to go up to 68% of the world living in a city, which means you have less resources, people living in close proximity to one another. When people live in close proximity to another, one another without having an outlet or a space just to even sit and think, 
things pop up, gang activity, and on a most brutal circumstance, war. And this is actually a picture from uh, one of the, uh, the war in Georgia, uh, close to Russia. Now, trauma itself is a, a detrimental uh, thing to take care of as a, as a healthcare practitioner, to witness in your community, uh, even as a concerned citizen. Around the globe, there are over 200,000 youth homicides of young people between the ages of 10 and 29. Over 200,000 per year. More than that, you have millions which are non-fatal injuries. These are actually, this is actually a young woman I took care of across the street at Kings County. She's about 20-something years old, and she has a GSW to the left humerus. Now, these, the trauma itself, the physical process, can leave long-term consequences. Now, as emergency physicians, as trauma physicians, I think we do a, a somewhat great job at resuscitating victims of violent trauma, but these patients keep coming back. And for our experiences as physicians and caretakers and, and uh, caseworkers and intervention specialists, trauma is a recurrent phenomenon. You have a patient that comes in the emergency department who's uh, been shot or stabbed, that rate of re-injury is as high as 44% within a five-year time frame. That rate of being killed is as high as 20% within a five-year time frame, with each subsequent injury increasing the rate of, um, of homicide. These are uh, both uh, patients that we took care of across the street. The first image uh, is, is a uh, gentleman that I took care of who has a, what we call a buck 50 scar or a smiley face injury. Uh, he was cut with a box cutter from the angle of the mandible all the way down. And the reason why we call it a buck 50 scar is because people say it takes 150 sutures to close it up. Um, we're actually just assessing the, his parotid uh, duct. And so we have a, a syringe right there with a catheter attached to it. Uh, injecting some air and water to see if there's some flow coming from that duct. He was actually cut by his father. Uh, this gentleman has a zone two injury to the, uh, to the neck. Uh, he wound up uh, surviving, but uh, had major consequences. There's something that we often think about uh, as it relates to violent trauma. We, we think about physical injuries, and I keep emphasizing what we think, because that's common perception. People think violence, they think about trauma, they don't pay attention to a lot of the other circumstances. But there's a study that came out, and uh, a concept that we talk about calling ACEs, or the adverse childhood experiences. Adverse childhood experiences can relate, can uh, be everything from uh, poor physical, uh, well, having physical injuries, poor emotional support, sexual abuse, um, neglect, mental illness, or pre-existing mental illness without proper psychosocial support systems. When somebody has, uh, the more ACEs they have, the more adverse childhood experiences they have, that increases the uh, susceptibility to develop chronic illnesses, everything from hypertension to obesity, and even worsening of uh, mental illnesses, as well as increasing the uh, risk of death. Now, who comes in the emergency department? Who are these victims? Who are these survivors of trauma? And what are some of these things that contribute? Uh, gang activity. These are young members of the Bloods Gang in, in Bed-Stuy, where I live. Uh, and this was taken by one of our uh, board members from Kavi. Um, having easy access to weapons. Uh, these are guns that are being sold at a gun show. We're not even talking about guns being sold from a federally licensed firearm dealer in a, uh, in a sporting goods store. We're talking about a random auction where guns are being sold. So that's one way that we can have easy access to weapons. <clears throat> Poor mental health support. And I keep bringing this up over and over again because we keep emphasizing on the physical aspects of trauma without really exploring and making sure there's a provision of psychosocial support. But you know, pre-existing mental illness without social support, without psychosocial support, is another risk factor uh, for engaging in recurrent violent injury. So. Because of what I saw uh, as an emergency physician in New York City and Chicago, um, I wound up working on a, a concept and looking at violence from a public health framework, and we called this program COVID. It had a bunch of different names before that, but in 2009, after uh, a couple of, uh, oops, after working with a number of medical students uh, from SUNY Downstate and Howard University and um, University of Illinois at Chicago, we wound up coming up with the name COVID. Now. Most of the people in here uh, are a combination of medical students, public health professionals, violence intervention specialists, and concerned citizens. Not everyone here is going to wind up doing violence prevention as a part of your overall careers. We hope that you do. Uh, well, actually, I, I'm hoping that you wind up coming up with some solutions so that we can stop doing this kind of work. My, my, my job and my plan is not to do this for the rest of my life, because if I am, that means that we haven't made the impact that we actually need to. Um, but we do hope that you're going to integrate social health practices and looking at um, tackling and 
and um, removing a lot of the social determinants which can have an impact on well-being and really looking at what constitutes overall wellness. But despite what happens, you're going to wind up working um, in spaces, in places where you don't have access to resources. So the next section of this talk is really you know, exploring what we do with Kavi, but also how do you create something from scratch? How do you create something with no money? Um, particularly, how do you develop programs with, res with limited resources? This is something that most medical students don't think about, most resident physicians don't think about, most attending physicians don't think about. We look at this, this, these issues that we see as healthcare practitioners and we go, wow, this is what we need to do. But then when somebody asks, how are you going to finance it? What are you going to do for it? Then there's often silence. Um, as a matter of fact, the medical students in here are a lot further ahead than many of the physicians we have across the street and on this side of the street because this is a, this is a tough process. And I was going to use some other bad language in here, but um, <laughs> I promise some people that I won't, I won't say certain, uh, use certain terminology. Um, but it is a tough process. And so how do you create programs with limited resources? Um, one of the things that, you know, before we wound up launching Kavi, well, I shouldn't say before we launched Kavi, when we were creating the, the framework um, of Kavi, before we wound up launching actual programming, back in the days when we were just doing advocacy work, um, I had some conversations with a number of key people. Uh, friends of mine who are entrepreneurs, I talked with my dad who's also an entrepreneur, and I also started looking at engineers. Uh, the reason why I looked at engineers is because engineers are a lot more efficient. They're just as smart as the medical students, um, but they go, you know what, mm, I'm not studying all day long. I don't want to kill myself just memorizing concepts. I do want to tackle an issue. So what engineers wind up doing, they have a concept called engineering design process thinking. The first thing that they uh, identify is what is the problem? So if you're tackling any social health issue, any violence prevention issue, even dealing with your, your patients or your clients, you have to you know, figure out what is the problem that we're trying to tackle here. Then after you ask that question, the next thing is what are your potential ideas to, to tackle this issue? What's the framework you're going to provide? What are the resources that person need, uh, needs to, to get out of the situation? Are these resources effective for this, for this patient's circumstance? You know, based on this individual's income disparities, access to care, other life circumstances, what are those, some of those solutions? And you don't have to necessarily give your patients or your clients all of these different ideas, but you come up, you brainstorm. You know, like when we talk to medical students when you're on your clinical rotations, we talk about your differential diagnosis. You don't have to act on everything in your differential diagnosis, but you've got to come up with a number of different ideas to both diagnose what this person can potentially have, and then what are the next steps that you're going to take in terms of treating the patient. And this is no different when you wind up developing an organization or um, creating any sort of solution to a, a larger problem. Then once you come up with all these different uh, problems as a result of brainstorming, you've got to act on that. And so there's a concept known as is rapid prototyping, where you're going to take, take these things that you've uh, created as a part of this plan, then you implement that. A lot of medical students, the reason why we, we, we tend to live in these theories, and the reason why I say we live in theories is because we like how stuff looks in our head, and we like how it sounds in our heads, but we wind up having to implement these things, they don't always have the same impact. And what engineers teach us is that you know, and anybody who's done any intervention, we have some of our intervention team members in the back over here and some other students that are scattered around here. This is an ongoing process. Um, violence intervention in, in particular, you know, I've been doing this work for 14, actually longer than 14 years. I've been doing community engagement since I was in middle school and high school. My dad's an activist. My mom's a teacher. This is like, this is like stuff that we did on, on an ongoing basis growing up. But I think about just violence intervention specifically, uh, maybe in 2008, 2009. There was no social media that existed. It might have been Black Voices or Black Planet uh, for people who are familiar with AOL, especially some of the older folks in the audience, but there was no social media. Twitter didn't exist. Um, Facebook was, being, was just evolving. Uh, there was no Instagram. And so certain types of beefs and conflicts that took place in a social setting, didn't, we didn't have to deal with back then. But 2019, 2020, you have a lot of uh, interpersonal conflicts that are purely arising because of social media. And so this was something that we had to factor in into our overall framework as we start looking at intervention work, both in the, in the hospitals, the schools, and, the, and in the communities. But you figure out, first you gotta figure out what is this problem I'm trying to tackle. Then you're gonna come up with a series of ideas to tackle that problem. Then you're gonna take one of those ideas and implement that. And then once you, once you test it and implement that, you figure out how, I, how do I do this more effectively and more efficiently. It's an ongoing process. You never actually stop perfecting this. 
Um, in 2009, um, I got, this is me back in the day when I had no gray hair and a lot more hair on top. Um, but I launched a program for minority medical students and students of color who had an interest in emergency medicine. Um, one of the students earlier talked about health disparities and we talk, talked about the community and, and marginalization. Uh, students of color have a higher attrition rate in medical school. When you look at people applying to competitive specialties like emergency medicine, some of the surgical subspecialties, there are very few of us, which is why when you go across the United States, and you talk to people about uh, physicians of color in emergency medicine, we all know each other. We all know each other. And it might be not even two degrees of separation, it might be one degree of separation. But in 2009, I launched a program for minority medical students, and we called it MMSEM. So we have MMSEM students in the audience. Christine uh, Ibrahim uh, was a participant um, last summer. And um, these students are working on different projects as it relates to uh, community health. Um, everything from violence intervention, global health projects, they're spending time in the emergency department. And after six weeks, the students in the group that I was working with came up with a, a name for the violence intervention program that had only existed on a series of papers and, and sketches, and they came up with the name Kavi, which stands for Kings Against Violence Initiative, but it's also a Sanskrit word that means thinker and doer. And over the years, we actually just celebrated 11 years of uh, MMSEM, but that was the foundation in giving a proper framework to the violence intervention efforts that are being taking place here in central Brooklyn. Um, after having a conversation with my dad, who's pretty practical, and if you want a straight answer with no filter, all you got to do is ask a 70-year-old black man. Actually, you just need to ask any old, old person uh, above the age of 65. The filter completely goes. And um, you know, in 2009, I had applied for a number of grants to do violence intervention work, uh, work around the hospital and around the community. I presented, present, did presentations at the hospital city council, other elected officials here at the medical school, and people said, wow, there's a great idea. Sorry, no money, no money, no money. And this had gone on for years. I, I, I came home, went over to my dad's house over at Flatbush, and I was kind of pissed off that we didn't get a grant. This is 2011, and you know he was just reading his magazine, and he said, why the hell should they give you any money? You haven't done anything. And I was like, man, that's kind of harsh. And, you know, I, and, I, and he was right, I hadn't done anything. I'd done some advocacy stuff, I'd done a lot of education stuff to medical professionals, but I wasn't actually doing the work. I'd done global health projects, built programs in Haiti with, with team members that were up and running, but if you look at violence intervention stuff, all I was doing was treating clients and just talking about the issue itself. And uh, my dad's an entrepreneur, and he also grew up, he's a child of the 60s, and um, you know, had a father who was kind of a pull yourself up by their own bootstrap. And so I talked to my dad, and I talked to uh, one of my friends who's an entrepreneur, and he said, there's a concept known as sweat equity. And I never heard about sweat equity before. Uh, and they said, look it up. And so I started reading business magazines and started looking at sweat equity, and wow. When somebody, when you um, create a business or a program, people say, wow, that is a great idea. But they're not gonna give you any money or any resources uh, to do the project unless they think that you actually have a vested interest. If money re and resources aren't there, are you gonna stick in? Are you gonna keep doing the work? If you're not gonna do the work and it winds up dying out, why should that person invest in you? Whether you're looking at an angel investor, whether you're looking at a venture capitalist or even a grant fund. A uh, grant funder, whether it's a public funder or, or a private funder. These institutions are looking at whether or not you as a student, as a, as a healthcare practitioner, uh, are going to contribute to the legacy of those institutions. And if you, aren't gonna, you don't have any staying power, they don't think you're going to be in this for the long run, they're not going to invest in you. And so I had to start thinking about what are the other resources that I had. And um, I also came to the, the, the realization that people don't invest in theoretical programs. And so we had the team from MMSEM. We also had other friends and family members. And we would meet regularly here at the medical school over at County um, in, my, in my living room. And we started creating this framework and figuring out how do we wind up launching this program with no money. And so a lot of discussions, a lot of sketches, fights, arguments, you name it. And I realized you gotta be fluid, and, you know, thinking about Bruce Lee, you gotta be like water. And the reason why I say being like water, not just because I'm a martial arts fan and practitioner, um, but you have to be adaptable. Um, as institutions, um, as physicians, and you know, we're taught to, you wanna be hard, you wanna be able to withstand all sorts of hardship. You wanna be this, this juggernaut in a sense that can withstand anything. What they don't teach you is that 
it's not that you're trying to be this edifice, this, this impenetrable. The goal is to be adaptable. And in order to be adaptable, you have to be fluid in your approach. Uh, for, the, for the early years, we were just focusing on trying to create violence intervention efforts in the hospital from a hospital-based prevention uh, framework. Not realizing that there were so many politics in the hospital that, and so many hoops that we had to jump through that it wasn't going to happen in that, in that fashion. And um, you know, after, again, getting pissed off another year about, about not getting funding, um, I wound up meeting with some people and saying, you know, why do we have to work with patients? You know, if the end goal is to improve community well-being, why are we only focusing and targeting on individuals who are victims and survivors of violent trauma? And so we decided to implement programming in phases and did away with doing hospital-based intervention at first and started off in a school. Um, we developed an entire curriculum, um, prevent, you know, focusing on violence intervention, looking at mediation, looking at conflict resolution, and decided to take it to one of the area high schools across the street from Kings County Hospital over at the Wingate High School campus. And said, you know what, we're going to do this program, but we're not going to do this stuff for the hospital just yet. Give me four students, uh, four of your, your poorest performing students in your school, students who are considered to be problematic. So those are students who, had, uh, who were gang members, students who had histories of frequent fighting and doing poorly in school. So they gave us four students. And we were going to meet with them throughout the week uh, for a series of maybe about four to five weeks, and then maybe transfer them and start doing programming at the hospital. Every week, we got another student. Another student, another student, another student. Now we did this work. I had no budget. I had no funding. Um, I wound up using volunteers. We used social work graduate students. We used students from SUNY Downstate School of Public Health who had to do their, um, their field work assignments. Those became our, our staff members. Um, they had a vested interest. Many of them were applying to medical school. So I was like, I could write you a hell of a letter of recommendation. I can't pay you anything. And I had enough money to buy pizza uh, for students. And so that's how we brought, that's how our original team, uh, team came together. So we started doing workshops in the school. Every week we got another student. By the end of the year, we had programming that was five days a week. And uh, with 56 students, with both young men that we were working with, and even young women, uh, which we call our Kavi Queens program. Uh, and then we, again, we did that. We did the work in the in the schools with 50 plus kids and no money. In addition to starting a hospital-based violence intervention program, again with no money, we did this stuff for about two and a half years with with zero funding, except for the goodness and kindness of friends and family. You can convince your friends and family to do stuff for a couple of years, but not long term. Um, but just just uh, just in terms of like people here, you don't want to exhaust all of your resources. But again your friends and family can be a vital resource. And particularly being a part of a medical school community, you have access to tons of resources that may not necessarily be uh, monetary. So our curriculum itself with Kavi focuses on mediation, conflict resolution. We incorporate restorative justice practices, looking at conflict, um, looking at um, how do we prevent these incidents from occurring? How do we uh, take a student who's considered to be at risk, which is technically every kid who lives in central Brooklyn or even Brooklyn itself, uh, particularly in areas where you have that sharp demarcation between the haves and have-nots. Those tend to be the areas that have the highest around, uh, rates of conflict, not just here in New York City, but around the world. How do you take them and empower them to create changes within their communities? And this is a lot of the work that we do with our weekly workshops that take place in the different schools around Brooklyn. Um, now we're at a point in time in our, in, in our programming where former participants are now our active facilitators and working with us. This is Latasia Moore, who is a uh, uh, one of our first students back in 2011, 2012, and now she's one of our facilitators at Kavi, and we have a number of other people working with us we call our peer facilitators. Um, our hospital program is a little bit different, and so, you know, we originally started off with making sure we prevented people from becoming patients and figuring out how do we empower uh, concerned citizens and people who are considered to be at risk. But remember, people who come into the hospital as victims and survivors of violent injury have a high rate of re-injury. 44% come back, 20% come back being killed in five years. 20%, that's higher than swine flu, that's higher than Ebola, all this other crap that people wind up putting out there that people have these major scares for but not paying attention to the rates of re-injury as it relates to violence. And so this is how our program works. This is the gentleman that I took care of who was assaulted uh, multiple times with a box cutter. Um, he wound up having, he had a pneumothorax on the uh, left and the right and wound up having to go to the operating room to have bowel repair because you see there's a little bit of evisceration of abdominal contents right there. Um, so this is how our hospital program works. 
Um, we have a patient who comes in injured. They're contacted by the uh, ER uh, triage staff, whether it's the ER nurse or the social worker. Uh, then a person comes down to see the patient. And those are our violence intervention uh, team members. We have some, and CAVI itself is an organization, but we work with many community partners. One uh, partner we have in particular is the organization Man Up Incorporated, which is based out in East New York. Um, our intervention team members come down and see the patients or their clients and ensure, one, that retaliation doesn't occur, but number two, to ensure that a sense of safety is maintained. There's an acronym that's often used in the violence intervention realm called SELF, which stands for safety, emotion, loss, and future. And so the team members will work with pa patients in the emergency department and on the floors uh, and, and when that person is discharged, but um, at the same time, the uh, emergency staff as well as the trauma surgery staff are ensuring that those injuries are taken care of. You can't just do the intervention work uh, from a psychosocial point of view and not pay attention to the physical injuries. You can't just take care of the physical injuries and not pay attention to a lot of psychosocial injuries and uh, support that's uh, often required. Now, patients who, who wind up uh, participating in violence intervention programs have lower rates of recidivism. Uh, people who don't engage. So the rates of recidivism may be as high as 4% for someone who's in active participation in an injury prevention program. But people who aren't participating, those, that recidivism rate is as high as 26%. So those are substantial differences. Now, doing the intervention work is important. On a school level to prevent people from becoming patients, doing work uh, in the hospital to ensure that those patients don't wind up having recurrent injuries and can return back to the community to ensure that there's a sense of safety uh, that's being provided. But you're, only, you're limited in your approach with actual programming. And so how do you train other people to do this type of work? And so a big component of CAVI, in addition to our hospital and our school program, is our community program, which focuses on education and development of other programs. Uh, here we are meeting with members uh, folks from the Department of Health and other violence intervention programs around New York City who are helping provide training and development so that they can also do that stuff a lot more effectively. Uh, with any kind of organization, any kind of business, you think, okay, how do I expand? Um, how do I augment the services that we're providing? Does that mean we take over additional sites and wind up creating a monopoly of organizations? Not necessarily, because when you create these monopolies, you don't always, often have uh, the same level of control. And so training and development is a lot cheaper, and it's also a way that you can expand and you can empower other groups to be able to do this work, and they can tailor that work to fit the specific needs of their community. I grew up in central Brooklyn. I grew up in downtown Brooklyn or in pre-gentrified Fort Greene, Bed-Stuy, and Flatbush. I know those neighborhoods very well. I've been out to East New York, but it doesn't make sense to do a lot of work out in East New York if I'm, that's not really my area of expertise. And so working with other people in the community who have areas of expertise in East New York, in Browns, or members like Man Up Incorporated, it makes sense to work uh, alongside them so that we can empower each other to do, the, to do this work a lot more effectively. Um, yeah. So when we start just looking at overall, like why are we here, and just you know, how does this stuff fit in with you as medical students, as future healthcare practitioners, as concerned citizens. The first thing, we just have to start rethinking what trauma means. Uh, trauma itself is beyond physical. It is vicarious. It is, it is passed on from generation to generation. Most physicians and most healthcare practitioners don't understand it, and because they don't understand it, it tends to come back more frequently with the patients coming in with these recurrent injuries. If you have a, if you have a client that's, that you're taking care of and, uh, and you're a healthcare practitioner, you don't understand the community in which that person comes from, what they have access to, what are the different barriers that they're trying to overcome, and you say, come back in six or seven days to get you, actually five days if it's a facial injury, because we have medical students and now you're gonna be pimped on surgery about how long your sutures need to be in place, but if you have an injury to the face, uh, those sutures come out in five days if they're on the extremity, uh, seven days days for those sutures to come out if they're on an area of flexion, maybe 10 to 14 days because of the, the constant movement, you uh, compromise the integrity of those sutures. If you, only, if you only understand that and not understand a lot of the barriers that are required for that patient to come in, maybe even safety, they're not going to come back. And you're going to uh, say that your patient is non-compliant and they're not interested in, in uh, having access to the proper care not recognizing this person lives in Bed-Stuy. He, he got injured right on, on the corner of Nostrand and, uh, and Madison Street. And even though the 44 bus goes straight up Nostrand Avenue, it's not a far walk to Kings County because he or she is walking with a limp and they got into a beef with people in their neighborhood. And now they're considered to be a target, which sets them up for additional opportunities to be taken advantage of. 
you call them non-compliant. And so understanding what this looks like um, as healthcare practitioners, as future practitioners, understanding who our patients are, the communities in which they come from, and understanding the specifics is part of the issue, but really helping them have access to the resources, not just to prevent them from uh, repeat injuries, but how do we ensure the, their own personal wellness and vitality? This is the key. This is, this is why we do this kind of work. I wanna thank you all for coming this, this early Saturday morning, and I'll be around for a brief moment, and if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gore. Uh, I think I speak for all of us when I say that was a really inspiring keynote speech.